Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. It's a great day to be alive, and it's a great day to be a child of God. We're glad you're with us today, and we trust and we pray that as you open your hearts and open your minds that you'll be blessed by letting the Bible speak. You've likely heard the following hymn by Thomas Shepard and George Allen. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. The consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free, and then go home my crown to wear, for there's a crown for me. A couple of touching experiences a few summers back inspired me to explore this subject based on a scripture in Matthew chapter 16, 24. While our family was leaving a Nashville Sounds minor league baseball game, we came upon a man carrying over his shoulder a teenage boy who was crippled and twisted by some disease. The boy didn't seem disturbed at all to be transported in such an unusual way. He seemed to be just thrilled to be at the game. This generated an interesting family discussion, though, with our preteen children as we walked across the old bridge back to our truck. Then a short time later, Oscar Morris, an elder in the Joplin, Missouri congregation, took my son Joey and I to a fascinating museum dedicated to George Washington Carver, the famous scientist and inventor. Many aspects of Carver's life inspire awe, but one detail that hit me and has stuck with me was that this man's favorite song, this man who persevered under incredible adversity, was Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone. Carver was a victim of appalling racial animosities. In fact, his description of the racial atrocities that he witnessed were every bit as brutal as any you have heard about Hit Hitler's Germany or Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Both of these experiences triggered the thought of Bible love and our focal point this morning from Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 which reads, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, before we look at this scripture in more detail, please enjoy our song. All around me every moment is the wondrous love of God, thrilling my soul, keeping me whole. And in lights of path to glory showing where the master trod, I am o'ershadowed by love. O'ershadowed by but God's just wondrous just love. His marvelous love. I'm on my way, way to, to rest above. In heaven above. And when I reach, reach that home, home so, so fair, exceedingly fair, His love will still, still be, be with, with me, me there. Will be with me there. And you ought to know the pleasure that his love to me now gives, thrilling my soul, keeping me whole. I shall share his joy and glory where the soul forever lives. I am o'ershadowed by love, o'ershadowed by, by God's, God's wondrous just love. His marvelous love. I'm on my way, way to, to realms of love. In heaven above. When I reach, reach that, that home, home so, so fair, exceedingly fair, His love will still, still be, be with, with me, me there. Me there. Have you ever wondered how these words sounded to the apostles the first time these words graced the Savior's lips? If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I'll tell you, they probably hit them a lot harder back then as men who, according to historians, knew that a hundred men died on a Roman cross in Jerusalem every year. They were hearing this message for the first time and were probably a bit confused. But the basic message was, 
and still is. If we want to be Jesus' disciple, we have to do three things. We must deal with self by denying self. We must deal with others and difficult circumstances by taking up our cross. And finally, simply, we must follow Jesus. After all, how hard could that be? Well, let's take a closer look. If anyone will come after me, or if anyone desires to come after me, Jesus is saying, in effect, do you want to be my disciples? Do you really want to follow me? How far are you willing to go? Then he gives us three ways in which we can test the intensity of our desire to follow him. And isn't what Jesus is saying here just another way of packaging the Spirit of the greatest commandment in Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and your neighbor as thyself. One fact is indisputable. I cannot truly love God and love my neighbor without denying myself without bearing my cross and following Jesus. We've certainly seen the accuracy of Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, that only a few will follow Jesus down the straight and narrow way, but the many will go down the broad path. He says again, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, we must say no to self. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could please God just by walking around saying no to other people? No, of course, is one of the first words we learn to speak as we hear it so frequently as a little one. And as little children, it's one of the words we use most frequently. And certainly there are times when being a disciple of Christ requires that we say no to others, whether it pertains to immorality or drugs or alcohol, lying, stealing, and on the list goes. But in this platinum text in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus does not say deny others or tell others no. Oh, no. He challenges us to tell ourselves no. Telling myself no would be hard enough if I lived in a vacuum and if I was isolated from everyone else. No to too much food. No to too much spending. No to too much sleeping, to too much entertainment and recreation. No to losing my temper, etc. But add to that the challenge of interacting with my peers and the constant barrage of the media telling me to say yes to self, have it your way, you deserve a break today. And self-discipline becomes even more demanding. On this scripture, scholar J.W. Garvey, McGarvey wrote, the disciple must learn to say no to many of the strongest cravings of his earthly nature. The cross is a symbol for duty which is to be performed daily at, even, at any cost, even that of the most painful death. The disciple must follow Jesus both as to his teaching and example. Then commentator Barnes adds, let him not seek his own happiness as the supreme object, but be willing to renounce all and lay down his life also if required. Tall order, isn't it? Denying self. Another great doctrine of Christ is found in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This command really is, again, the same message as Matthew 16, 24, just wrapped up in more positive language. Jesus is here saying that we should follow him, that we should build our life around kingdom issues, the kingdom of God and righteous living. Jesus speaks to the same truth in John 6, verse 38, when he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, 
but the will of him who sent me. And then, of course, we have the ultimate teaching method, example, and Jesus' example in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke 22, 42, we find, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. No word more aptly describes Jesus than self-denial. Paul saturates his epistles with the teaching of self-denial. Speaking of perilous times, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. What's he saying? This is not to say that God is warning us against caring about ourselves. We are not to abhor or hate ourselves. Remember, Jesus said, Love thy neighbor as thyself. What does he mean here? Thayer nails the thrust of this warning when he says, not to be too intent on one's own interest. That's just natural to do that, just to preserve oneself and to take care of oneself, to put oneself first. So avoiding this pitfall will demand a high level of self-awareness and aggressive self-regulation. I like how Stephen Covey illustrates this point. He says the difference between man and beast, or one of them anyway, is our pause button. Whenever we're presented with a threat or temptation, unlike the animal who responds instantly by instinct, we have a built-in mechanism where we ch can choose to stop and reflect before taking action. We can think about what we would ordinarily naturally tend to do, then think of another decision. At this point, we can tell the flesh, no. We can deny ourselves. Whenever we let down our guard, however, we open ourselves up to the wiles of Satan. He wants to use us for harm and not helping others. This seems to be the thrust of Galatians 2, 20, putting down the flesh. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. By aggressively checking the flesh, we increase the reflecting time of our pause button before we react self-denial. Augustine, the most famous fourth century Christian writer, provides a good example of denying the flesh. Rather extreme, but it's a good example. Soon after his conversion, he was walking down the street in Milan, Italy, where he met a harlot whom he had known in days gone by. She called to him, but he would not answer. He kept right on walking. Augustine, she called out, it is I. Without missing a beat and with the assurance of Christ in his heart, Augustine replied, yes, but it is no longer I. Because of Jesus, Augustine denied himself. We've got to be able to do that too. Because of Jesus, Augustine did so and so must we. Jesus was crucified and Augustine was crucified with Christ, and we must do the same if we're to be his disciples. But what does that mean practically in everyday Christian living? It means that we submit to God's will. It means that we don't force our wants and our wishes on God, but we seek to please him. It's not about our agenda. It's about God's agenda. It's about the kingdom. It's about the church. It's about what's best for those who are seeking God and to please God. In other words, when new scriptural truth confronts us, we do not bow up and balk at God. Instead, we humbly obey him. By now, you can see why the list of qualifications for the elder, the pastor, and the bishop 
given in Titus 1, 7, and 8, we find that this man, the elder, bishop, pastor, must not be self-willed, but must be self-controlled. One who is self-controlled masters his desires and passions. His emotions don't control him. He controls his emotions. This quality listed among the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 demonstrates maturity in the faith. We see in Acts 24, verse 25, that this theme played a prominent role in the apostles' preaching. Now, as Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix trembled. As already noted, the elder must not be self-willed. W. E. Vine says that this word denotes one who, dominated by self-interest and inconsiderate of others, arrogantly asserts his own will. He goes on to say, this expert on biblical Greek, biblical New Testament Greek, that this word self-willed is the opposite of gentle. Then he quotes Trench who says, one who so far overvaluing any determination at which he has himself once arrived that he will not be removed from it. Oh, we can see this in the drug addict, the terrorist, the atheist, but we must realize that Christians are also vulnerable to moral and doctrinal error, just misbehavior in general, being rude. Love is not rude. Once again, Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Paul associates this fleshly frailty with many potential pitfalls. He writes that the root of disobedience is a self-seeking spirit in Romans chapter 2, verse 8. He puts it this way, to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, for them lies in store indignation and wrath. This is how you walk with the devil, not how you walk with the deliverer. This is how you follow Satan, not the Savior. We cannot deny ourselves while practicing what Paul calls in Colossians 2, verse 23, self-imposed religion, or as the King James puts it, will worship. Maybe you've wondered what that phrase actually means. Well, we're addressing it right here. It has to do with denying self. Thayer explains this as worship which one prescribes and devises for himself, contrary to the contents and nature of faith which ought to be directed to Christ. We see this disposition when otherwise devoted believers respond, for example, to the command in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 and 35, let your women keep silent in the churches. When they respond to that with, well, I know that the New Testament only provides the example of men as teachers in the public arena in the church, but we're going to have women teachers anyway. Now, that's the definition of will worship. This approach to the Scriptures exposes an unwillingness to deny self. Another instance of this idea of self-control is found in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9, where the Holy Spirit teaches that women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. You may find it interesting that this word sobriety is also translated self-restraint. Unfortunately, when it comes to dress, men and women of the world show next to no restraint. Well, as has been said of women in their clothing sometimes, it hesitates to begin and ends almost immediately. Well, that shows a lack of self-control, self-restraint. We must show self-restraint as Christians in how we dress. Now let's consider Jesus' own explanation of self-denial in Matthew 16, verse 25. It's the next verse in our text. He says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
In the same vein, we find in Mark 9, 35, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. This is fundamental to Christian living. Jesus turned, though, when he issued this teaching, the conventional wisdom on its head, probably more so in our competitive world today than ever before. Everyone feels that they have to win. But Jesus says, when it comes to Christianity, you can win by losing. Once again, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It just stands to reason that the more selfless we become, the more valiantly we can carry our cross. When Jesus took up the cross, he was suffering from pain, exhaustion, dehydration. He could have canceled the crucifixion and called for an angelic rescue, but he bore the cross and he bore our sins. In a sense, Jesus bore with Peter when he denied him thrice. Jesus bore with Judas when he betrayed him with a kiss. How do you not retaliate in the face of such a hateful gesture? Jesus bore with the chief priests, Herod, Pilate, and the soldiers. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. As the old song says, he bore it all that I might live. So must Jesus bear the cross alone? Oh, no. We all, if we're going to be his disciples, have our own cross to bear. The question is, will I take up my cross today? Will you? Luther once aptly said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. One reason the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the world is that it involves denying self and bearing burdens. That cuts against the grain and repulses the world. Jesus actually issues an ultimatum along these lines in Matthew 10, verse 38. He who does not take his cross, he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The very association with the crucifixion tells us that cross-bearing is not natural. I associate the cross with pain and suffering, but it carries with it the idea of bearing burdens. After a complicated delivery in 1962, Rick Hoyt was born with his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. Oxygen deprivation left him in a vegetative state. Doctors suggested institutionalizing him, but the Hoyts wouldn't have it. They were going to raise him as normally as possible. At age 10, cutting-edge technology allowed Rick to communicate. A cursor would move across the screen, filled with rows of letters. And when the cursor highlighted a letter that Rick wanted, he would click a switch with the side of his head. His first words were, Go Bruins! He had been following, unbeknownst to them, as closely as the rest of the family, the Boston Bruins, who were then in the Stanley Cup Finals. Five years later, at age 15, Rick asked his dad to push him in his wheelchair for a five-mile benefit run for a local athlete who'd been paralyzed in an auto accident. Even though Rick's dad, Dick, was not a long-distance runner, he agreed. Rick's words more than made up for their next-to-last finish. Dad, when I was out there, I didn't feel like I was handicapped. At that moment, Dick dedicated his life to pushing Rick in a wheelchair in long-distance runs. Dick then learned how to swim and train to compete in marathons. When biking, Rick is rigged to ride in front of Dick's bike. When Dick swims, Rick is in a small, firmly stabilized boat tied to Dick's waist. The father-son team has competed in over 900 races, including 64 marathons and 200 triathlons. Yeah, but when Jesus talks about taking my cross, bearing my cross, carrying my cross, does that really involve bearing others' burdens? Yes, we've seen it does. More on that after this song. I am thinking today. I'm thinking today. A beautiful place with a river that flows. Welcome waiting on high. It waits on high. My troubles down here. My troubles down here. And I'm safely home. Glory is waiting over there in the by and by. The by and by. I can see them all gathered there around the throne. The beautiful Fill the lofty heavenly sky. 
can wait. I know it can't be very long. Glory is waiting over there. In the by and by. In the by and by. While every man shall bear his own burden, according to Galatians chapter 6, verse 5, in the sense of every one of us must take care of our own business, every one of us must carry his own load. At the same time, we must be prepared to help others, according to Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. We're so glad that you've been with us today, and um, if you're interested in a copy of this particular message, we encourage you to write us, and we'll give you the information here uh, shortly, and um, contact us, and we'll be happy to send that out. Galatians 6, 2, let me make this point, says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I want you to join us next week as we continue in our quest for truth in a world of religious confusion.